example of this. If by spill do you mean throw? If by spill do you mean throw? Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, this is a, my core conversation on the status uh, of the configuration management initiative. Yes, a question? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so um, for those who don't know, my name is Greg Dunlap. I am Hayrocker on Twitter. Um, and I'm the, I'm the lead of the configuration management initiative. Um, so. For those who haven't been around, um, here is a brief history of the Configuration Management Initiative to this point. Um, at DrupalCon Chicago, um, Dries asked me to lead this initiative, and I went to my employer and said I need time to do this, and my employer then, Node One, now Wunderkraut, um, but I don't work there anymore anyways. Um, <laughs> not because of anything bad, they're all fantastic people. Um, uh, said, I'll, we'll give you 50% of your billable hours to work on this configuration management initiative, which was awesome. And so um, I put together a code sprint in conjunction with Drupal Camp Colorado later that year. It was myself and David Strauss and Larry Garfield and Chex and Angie um, with some assistance from uh, Greg Nadison and Ben Jevens. And we came up with the initial architecture for the, for the, for the configuration management system. And uh, I mostly, with some help, um, from various people, too numerous to name at this point, um, put that, uh, coded that system up and got the first patch into core. And what happened after that was we began um, running um, implementations of this system into uh, core. And at DrupalCon Denver last year, I, I started creating all of, the, all of the issues to say, convert this to core, convert this to core, convert, convert this to core. And we had a code sprint, and it was amazing. And like 20 people showed up, and like four people got their first core patches in and stuff like that. But another thing that happened at that code sprint was we started doing these implementations, and we started realizing two things. First was that none of these implementations were really novice issues, because every single one of them we found was like, we'd start working on it, and we're like, oh, hmm, this needs to be done in the installer. Hmm, okay, so we'll do such and such. Oh, but in the installer, we don't have a database yet. So how are we going to do this? And it was like you'd see a little thread there, and you'd start pulling on it, and the next thing you know, your entire sweater was on the floor, and all you have is a pile of yarn. And so that was the first thing that happened at that. The other thing that happened at that was we started realizing, because we had never actually used the system that we designed before, that various parts of it, um, didn't work the way that we expected them to or the way that we wanted them to in various things. Um, so from that, we um, proceeded on a period of, first off, um, solving core issues that blocked our implementations that we were having or redesigning the implementations that existed in core to work better with the system in combination with re-architecting parts of the system to make it more flexible and more representative of the system we wanted. Um, Ultimately, what we really want is a system in which your configuration, which as we've defined it is anything that's not an entity um, with, a, with an asterisk next to that, um, um, being represented canonically in the file system and those files which always represent the current state of your system being able to be deployed to a second system on which you can press a button and have that configuration represented in whole on the new system. Um, that's really the goal in the end. Um, so here's what we've got right now. We do have configuration in the files right now. They're stored in YAML, um, and they're represented. They're mostly tied in the way of saying a system, one setting screen in the admin is represented by one file. Um, or in the case of something like image styles, one image style is represented by one file. 
um, files are loaded into what we've called the active store. Um, the active store is a database table which holds those files, not in YAML, but in, P but in serialized PHP because it's faster to use and since it's not, and the files need to be more human readable, but in the database we don't care, we just want it to be fast. Um, and, the, and that offers a nice separation because when you take a file and load it into the active store, we may want to do some validation that says, oh, this isn't valid YAML, get rid of this one, or this isn't a valid view, get rid of it. And you can do that, but um, what's in the active store is always known to be good. So even if you push an inval a syntactically invalid YAML file, your site won't die, because everything that gets, actually gets loaded at the active store we know is good. And it also acts as a caching mechanism because it's faster than reading from the files and things like that. We have a central API to manage our configuration data, which we've never had before. One of the great problems of features is that features does not implement a central API which everything uses. Features implements its own API which everybody else has to implement. And that's one of the reasons why features doesn't have all of the coverage of all of the contrib modules because they don't use it. But also, it can't control core, which stores things in a hundred different formats depending on if they're users or if they're IP address lists or whatever. And so, um, a huge part of features is writing one-off implementations for things in core that don't that it doesn't have any other way to deal with. So, um, we have a central API to manage the data that everybody's going to use. That's awesome. We have the basic ability at the API level to import new configuration or as of yesterday to do that through Drush, thanks to Alex Pot. Did that get committed? Yeah. No. Uh, huh? Today or tomorrow. Today or tomorrow that'll get committed. So you can actually, you will actually be able to import configuration through Drush before you can do it through the UI. <laughs> um, so um, the basic ability to actually import new configuration, which is awesome. Modules can supply default configuration, which is the default set of settings that a module ships with. And when they're installed, those settings are copied over into the live area. And, you know, that's great. Um, and when you install your, when you install Drupal, it creates a configuration directory. It, it uh, copies over all these files and installs the new configuration. It deals with the configuration that it needs to um, in, the, in the setup screen, in the site information screen. It also doesn't deal with configuration that it needs before the database is loaded and all of these things. So this is all stuff that we've got, which is great, and we've made a lot of progress, and it's awesome. Here's what we don't got. Um, and for each of these things, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you this list, and then for each one of these, I'm going to run through the dependency chain that we have to, that we have to solve in order to get these things into core. And um, and the decisions that we have to make um, because we are at a point in the cycle right now where we have some very tough calls to make because we have three months left for feature freeze and we have limited resources and very, very, very um, uh, aggressive goals. Um, and so I wanted to show and be very clear about because I think a lot of people don't realize the kind of, the kind of things that happen in order to make some of these things work. Um, so what we don't have is a, is a user-facing interface for actually importing the configuration that you move from site to site. You saw Dries's keynote and he had that demonstration of that import happening. Which there was a little bit of hand-waving going on there. Um, what had happened was we created, it, we created a UI. The UI, it turns out, was horribly broken unless you used it in this one very specific way. And what Angie did was she used it in that one very specific way. And when you do, it looks really impressive. Unfortunately, if you do it any other way, it deletes all of the configuration on your site. Um, if you can imagine going into a Drupal 6 site and simply deleting your variable table, that's about the extent of, the, of what we're talking about. So we decided not to commit it, but she used it as a demo. Um, we don't have multilingual configuration at all. Um, and we haven't converted all of core to the configuration management system at all. Um, so let's talk about each of these things and what needs to be done to get them done. First, let's talk about multilingual configuration. Um, there's really two aspects to multilingual configuration. There's translation of strings, which is one thing. Um, the, let me think of one, like your um, site slogan, for instance. This is a piece of text that you type in a language and in other language, you want it translated to each of those languages, the same text translated to each of those languages. 
That's one part of, multi of the multilingual stuff. The second part is what we're calling internationalization, which is different, which is things like, I want my site's front page in French to be different from my site's front page in Spanish. Or I want to have 10 nodes on my site's front page in French and five on my site front page in Spanish. They're things that are different depending on the, or your site logo. That's another great one because it has nothing to do with text. It's an image, right? It's a path to an image. I want it to be different on this site than that site. It's two strings that are different, but they're not being translated. And that's a really key difference that we need to keep in mind when we talk about internationalization. And um, this is a really complicated problem space. If anybody was here for Gabor's uh, presentation about the multilingual initiative, there's a lot of pieces to this pie, and, and, it, and it's extremely complicated. And these sort of ways in which we've been hacking around it in core and contrib make implementing it even more complicated now. So here's a chart of what we need to do to have multilingual support. Um, in Barcelona, at Drupal Dev Days last year, we made a decision to implement a context system into the configuration management system. And what that means is that um, you will be able to modify your configuration based on a, on a, on a context, of which a, a current language will be one that's implemented in core. You'll be able to do others, like for instance, domain access will be implemented almost certainly as a context on which configuration is changed. Um, or you could make one to set your local site settings different than your live site settings and things like that. But this is the one we're doing, multilingual support. So the first thing that it does is it implements Symfony's events and subscribers system, um, which means that you can, it, which is a way to sort of do hooks but not be tied to needing all of the modular parts of hooks that, that core needs to work. Um, we also need metadata for configuration in order to source some stuff that translation needs. And then once both of those things are done, we can start implementing it and surfacing it in the, in the CMI APIs. Um, so events and subscribers. This actually got committed last night around 1.30 in the morning. So um, the way that this works is that um, you create a system and in your system, you, you say at this point, oh, I'm going to fire off an event. Like, I'm saving a node, so I'm going to fire off the node save event. And then um, people who want to respond to that system can register themselves as listeners for that event and do things. Um, the nice thing about this that's, um, that's separate from hooks is that we don't have to have the system module loaded for this to work. It's completely tied to um, object-oriented code and the PSR0 class loader, which means that um, any of the code that it needs will be auto-loaded from the first time that it's called, which is really excellent because that means that we can do this at any point in the bootstrap, and setting up these contexts has to happen very, very early in the bootstrap for them to be effective. Um, that was why we decided to go with this system, even though it's a system we haven't really used in core very much, but I predict will spread um, soon enough. Um, so that, that's actually been committed, so that's great. Um, we need metadata for our configuration. Uh, this was something that I fought for a really long time because scope creep in CMI has been something that I've had to that I've had to like chop away with an axe since the beginning. But one of the things that we really need to know is which pieces of configuration um, are translatable strings and which pieces of configuration are not. Because one of the things that we have to do for the translators is they have all of these tools which list all of the translatable strings in Drupal so that they can look at them and say, here's a string that I need to translate into another string. And without that, it's very, very difficult for them to tell what they need to translate and what they don't without digging through the code themselves. Um, so if we're gonna support translatability and configuration in any meaningful way, we have to introduce a metadata system that's, that, will, that will store at least a key for a piece of configuration whether and whether or not it is a translatable string. Um, and then the multilingual context Im implementation can, can look at those and grab them and translate them if it needs to. They, the tools that configuration that uh, multilingual people use to grab translatable strings can grab them and that will be great. So um, these are, these are, there is a patch for this um, that exists. Um, it's, it was, it's a very early implementation um, and we've already decided to scale it back some. Um, but it needs to be revisited and committed. And then, of course, once these two dependencies are done, it needs to actually be, all of this stuff needs to be implemented in the CMI and surfaced and put together. So that's, that's, this is the simplest set of dependencies that we have to work with to make those three things happen. 
what's next? Ah, uh, yes. Um, by the way, if you, it, it's interesting, if you type tombstone generator into Google, you get a surprising number of results. Um, so we want to convert core systems, but really what we want to do is get rid of the variable system entirely. And they're not necessarily the same thing as we will see here. So in order to remove the variable system, there's two things. One of, the, one of the things about the variable system is that there's a lot of stuff that's stored in it which is not really configuration, it's state information. A good example is the last time that cron was run. This is stored in the very, it's, actually, is that still stored in the variable system? It is, okay, because I know we have that semaphore thing too that's stored in the locking system that was stored in the variable system. Right. There's things exactly like that. Another example is, um, for instance, uh, this is actually really interesting, and I never knew about this until recently. If you delete a field from a, uh, if you delete a field from a bundle, what happens is that the field um, is not really deleted. What it's done is it's marked as deleted, and then it doesn't show up in the UI. And then in the background on cron, all of the data in that field is periodically deleted until all of the data is gone, and then the field which has been marked as deleted is actually deleted. Now, um, what, that's, there's the definition of the field, which is definitely configuration, but the marking of the field as deleted is not configuration at all, because you don't want to deploy this to your live site. You want to, <laughs> you want to, all you want to do is say to your live site, I deleted a field, right? Or this field is gone. And, and, from our and in our system right now, we have files, right? So if you have a new file that wasn't there before, it's a creation. If you have a missing file that was there before, it's a deletion. So what you want to have happen is the field system deletes the file and it's gone and that's it. If behind the scenes it wants to store that the, that the file has been, de that, that uh, the field has been deleted, you don't want to store it in that file and leave the file there because if you deploy that, it's going to screw up all sorts of state information because you're in the middle of a deletion on the remote site. So this, isn't very, this is one of the more complicated reasons why we need state separated from, um, from configuration. Um, um, <laughs> and, this is, and this is the kind of thing where, where we need to start thinking about priorities. So we need to implement a system to store state. Um, um, Mark Sonnebaum wrote a really, nice, a really nice key value store, which would be great for storing state. It's a nice separate component. It's completely separated from Drupal, and it could be used in any PHP system that implements PSR0 as a key value store. Mark Sonnebaum said, this is great. We should share this with the rest of the PHP community, just like we've been taking stuff that, that Symfony shared in exactly the same way. One of the interesting side effects of that is Drupal is GPL but most of the modern PHP projects are MIT or Apache licensed, and they're not compatible. And so if we want to do that, we cannot commit that code to, to Drupal.org and share it because then it becomes tainted and the other projects can't use it. Um, so what we talked about doing is releasing it on GitHub and then including it back into Drupal core as a remote vendor include like we're doing with the Symfony stuff but still marking it as Drupal stuff because we wanted, you know, this is, and so long, long story short, there's a very long set of issues to actually get a state system into core, which really have nothing to do with there being a state system in core, except for ancillarily. And one of the things that's interesting here that I think it's good to point out is that a lot of times in the community, I think we make decisions about things that are about we want to do what's really right in the long run. And a lot of times I think those decisions are based on, you know, we have a three-year release cycle and if we don't do it really right now, we're stuck with it for three years. And a lot of it is, well, if we commit this and it's GPL, then we're stuck. We can't reverse that decision. But on the other hand, if we worry about these things and take time and time and time working them out, some of our very high-level goals are dead. And when we get this late in the release cycle, we need to really think about what our priorities are overall. And this is a really good example of that because we could convert all of core to, con to the configuration management system and do all of the implementations, and we haven't even gotten to that thing over here yet. And, and, um, and we still wouldn't be able to remove the variable table because of all of this other stuff that's in it right now. So, I, oh, I just gave you the rant about state. Um, configurable thingies are something we're talking about. As we've converted things to core, we've discovered that there's sort of two 
um, types of configuration in core. There's the stuff that goes into the variable table, which is just data, one piece of data. And there's stuff that's more like an implementation of an instance of a business object. For instance, an image style, a uh, field type, a taxonomy vocabulary. Um, these things have a different set of requirements than static data do. And the set of requirements that they have are all common amongst each other. They need to be able to fire hooks when events happen. They need to be able to respond to hooks when events happen. They need to have CRUD functionality. They need to do their own special handling when the import and export process runs. Um, so um, Sun came up with the idea that we should um, create a base class and interface for these to um, wrap the common functionality and that um, all of the um, things that implement this type of object could descend from that and then we'd have a nice system in core that represents how we feel that more complicated pieces of, in, of configuration should be implemented. Um, and it's a really great idea and then it also um, presents a, a, a best practice for contrib to follow because one of the things that we do in core all the time is we implement subsystems and then we don't like fully follow through implementing them through core and then contrib just follows what core does all the time. And so um, we want to do what's right in core and what's standard in core as much as we can because contrib is just going to follow our suit. And again, if we don't, we're stuck with it for three more years. So um, this is something that we're trying to sort out before we do the more complicated in implementations because if we do the more complicated implementations, we end up and having to go back and do them all completely over again. So. That was the second chain of dependencies in order to get, um, in order to get core converted to the new system. Now, a UI for configuration so that you can do, so that you can press that button and have it work. We need to, um, we need to have the import system finished. The basics of the import system are in, um, and it works really well for the static variable kind of configuration, um, but it's been largely untested for anything more complicated than that. We needed, we um, determined at some point that um, the implementation, we determined two things from the architecture standpoint while we were doing implementations. One is that um, having um, a single directory from which you save files and read files to import them into the system is problematic because, um, because you can have a situation where you push your files to the live site and then configuration changes are made on the live site which override the files that you just pushed. And, they, and, and there are all sorts of ugly race condition things that can happen in that situation. So we, de we decided that we would actually make it a two directory solution. Your live data is over here, but you import config that you manage from over here. And um, it actually has a really nice workflow. It's a little more complicated than the single directory solution. But I have a graph, it's in an issue that I didn't have time to put in here or explain because we're gonna be here for quite a while anyways. Um, and um, it's really cool. Um, uh, the other thing that we realized is that in the current system with the active store, the files are not truly canonical um, because if you, if you know, uh, Earl was the one who brought this up first. If you um, deploy a view and view, views reads it in, Views wants to validate that that view is, is okay, that the object is created properly, that a config module didn't add some crap into it that's wrong and broke it or anything because if you import the view without doing that, it can bust all sorts of stuff all over your site. Um, so let's say that Views imports this thing. It says it's broken and so it doesn't put it into the active store. Now what you have over here is broken stuff sitting in your live files directory but it's not actually being read because all the reads on a daily basis are coming from the active store. Your files at that point are not canonical anymore. You've got broken data there. And we want a, po we want a point where your files always represent the live version of your site. Um, so Sun uh, um, came up with this idea that um, we could do, um, what we should do is actually make the files live storage and, turn the ca and, and make the database just a cache for those files. Um, but then I said, we lose, we lose, if we do that, we lose the ability that I like in the active store to protect people from pushing dead files. But then we realized if we had a two directory solution, then we have that back again. And so these two things kind of happened at the same time. Um, I wasn't supposed to be, just, just never mind. So 
We either need to, we either need to keep with the active store or change to that, and then we need to start testing out these complex implementations to make sure that they work. Um, we need to implement UUID IDs for configuration um, because otherwise we have no way to know if pieces of configuration have been renamed or not. But we can't have the UIs be the file names for the configuration because we want those to be readable so that when you do a git status you know what you're looking at and things like that. And then finally, we still need to do the configurable thingies that I told you about. So live import directories, I just explained that. File storage and cache, I just explained that. This, and this all has to be done before we can even start testing pressing that button I showed you. There. And, oh, I passed the cat, didn't I? There's more stuff still beyond that. That's just the stuff that we absolutely have to ship to not consider the entire initiative a failure. But let's talk about some other stuff. Um, we have no way of versioning configuration right now. Um, one of the things that views and C tools do is they allow you to say, oh, this configuration is for views version one. And views version two has a new schema for its configuration. And so you can tell when you upgrade to views two that the stuff that, that the exported views that you have from the old version are old and then views two can throw off warnings saying you need to update these and convert them and save them back out again. We can't do that if we if you try to upgrade it, then either everything has to be upgraded in the upgrade process of the module or everything's gonna fall apart. We have no, uh, we have no system for managing that right now. We have no ma system for cleaning up configuration after you remove it. Um, Right now, all of us have experienced variables tables that have 5,000 entries in them, of which 4,000 are related to modules that aren't installed on the site anymore. Um, we would really like to implement a way to not do that anymore in Drupal core, but I can't prioritize it really because it's not a feature reversion. It's just something that continues to suck. And so I, I would really like to make things not suck anymore. Um, we can't tell right now if config on a live site has been overridden since the last time you imported it like you can with views right now. Um, I got into a big argument at DrupalCon in Denver uh, with a guy about this. He came up to the mic and said, how can I do this? And I said, you can't. And he said, why not? And I said, well, just don't, mod just don't edit uh, your data on the live site, implement a proper workflow. And he said, well, that's not realistic for our clients. And I said, well, the reason it's not realistic for your clients is because right now in Drupal 6, in Drupal 7, it's impossible to implement a proper workflow. And if it was possible, then it would be very easy. And now that you can, you should. And he did not like that answer. And I, he posted a blog post to Drupal Planet complaining about how I was out of touch with the needs of uh, community. And this is typical of core developers who don't, uh, who don't take into account end user um, needs. And he got like 50 comments from people who, who, who said the same thing. And, and after, I, after I got done wanting to burn everything down, I realized, <laughs> I realized that if we're, going to, if we're going to take over the functionality of what features does now, then this would be considered a feature reversion. But on the other hand, it's, it's difficult for me to, to say that this is a requirement, because I don't think it is. And honestly, a contrib module could implement it if they wanted to. We have all of the pieces in the system to do that. And as a matter of fact, um, this guy from Denmark, ZenDK, is he here? He's back there. He has already written a contrib module to do this. And not only does it store that, um, not only does it store the snapshots every time you import, it keeps all of the old ones so that you can revert to like the one from five imports ago and back to this one. And not only does it do that, it has all of this web services stuff so that you can tell the diffs from your live site to your remote site without moving any files around at all. This is a contrib module that already exists. That's awesome. But we don't have this right now. <laughs> we, the config system absolutely implemented some performance reversions. Um, performance has taken a hit because of it. But we can't even begin profiling it until the architecture changes we need to make are done because it's stupid to profile it now. We're going to change all the architecture around. Um, 
Thankfully, this kind of stuff can be done after feature, this, th this thing at least, can be done after feature freeze, but it still has to be done in addition to a lot of other stuff. We wanted to do a UI for the multilingual stuff. We wanted to be able to say in the user interface, this field is a text field that is subject to translations, or this widget needs a different widget for France than for Spain and all of this kind of stuff. And we have no, we, we have not and will not have anything like that. And that stuff will continue to live in contrib, which is a shame. Um, content staging was my biggest priority when I started this initiative, and I haven't had time to think about it at all. Um, thankfully, fa people like Fago and Dick Olson and Link Clark have started thinking about it in the context of the idea that they're doing in Larry's initiative for um, a common data serialization format for, um, for entities, which is awesome. But on the other hand, Larry is probably going to have to scale back his initiative because he doesn't have enough help and that we're not going, we may not ship natively with any web services in core at all. We may just ship with the plumbing to make sure that you can implement them in a way that's not completely hacky. Um, well, I wanted to, I wanted to, I, I thought, I always th thought that um, the two are combined because you should be able to rec replicate pieces of your site between them as, as needed. Um, and all, I never even wanted to implement a UI for content staging. I always thought that as long as the pieces of core that are broken that prevent it now, UUIDs for pieces of content so you don't have serial ID collision anymore, um, the decoupling of the saving of content from the form system so that you can actually save stuff properly without having to do Drupal execute, um, those kinds of things. If we could implement those, then I don't care about implementing the UI, Contrib can take care of it. And we haven't even gotten that far yet. System settings form is completely broken with the new config system. System settings form relies on a single key to write data into the variables table. What we have right now is sort of a two key system, the first key being the name of the file that data is stored in, the second key being the piece of data stored in the file. And um, in order to do that, we will have to put together some kind of data binding solution basically into the form API to say, this piece of data needs to be stored over here. Um, there is a patch in that queue. I'm not even sure what its status is at this point because I haven't taken a look at it in a long time. Um, but um, if this doesn't happen, I, I, we can, I, my opinion is we can ship without this because we've implemented all of the stuff with their forms and they're prepared, they're prepared for the possibility of a system settings form getting done and in, in, but if it doesn't get done and in, in, then it doesn't. I don't think anybody would disagree that it would really suck if we didn't do any of these things. So this is where, this is where we get to um, what we can do to help, um, you know, I had lofty goals for getting this system done, and people like Sun and Alex Pot and Bejeebus and all sorts of people have been have been have been doing a ton of stuff to get this work done. Um, but we all have we all have very limited resources, obviously, and it's a little frustrating to me when um, I talk to companies who are constantly coming up to me and telling me that this is the most important thing to get done in core, and and I'm pointing out to them that I'm doing something that will easily save them. 100 man hours per project. I mean, we're talking about chopping a quarter of a million dollars off of estimates that they can use to market and ship to clients, and then they tell me they don't have any time or money to donate to this <laughs> initiative. It makes me a little frustrated. And so, um, but we still need to get some stuff help, um, help. And before I do that, I would like to acknowledge the people who have helped up to this point. My former employer, Node 1, for a year gave me 50% of my billable hours to work on this project, which is the only reason we got as far as we did now, which is amazing. Pantheon, recently, I've begun a fundraising drive to try and fund myself to, um, to, to, um, to, whew, sorry, to work on, to work on configuration management initiative full time from now until the end of feature freeze. And Pantheon are the first people who step up and, and, get, and, and have pledged to give me $5,000 to work towards that. Um, and over the years, Acquia has, has flown me and Sun and other people around to code sprints all over the place because we realize how productive it is to have people in one place. I mean, I can't, I mean, you know, having me and Wychad and Swentel here, um, Swentel has already written like the first patch for implementing field API and CMI. And, you know, we've been sitting around and talking about it. It's incredibly productive. And we try and get as much done at these things before we, before we wander off. And Acquia has been really helpful with that. 
Um, but here's what we can do. If you're interested in getting um, involved in the, in the configuration management initiative, you can, I'm always on the Drupal CMI channel in IRC on freenode.net. Um, and anybody who's interested can get me there. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying more and more as I can to organize um, much more specific tasks that people can work on, that people can target. Um, because I understand that one of the, one of the weird things about our, our um, community is that a lot of people have limited chunks of time. Like they may have 20 hours this week because they're in between project, but then they're gone. And if I don't have a 20 hour chunk of work to do, I have something that's like, oh, we need to work on this issue and we'll be done in three weeks, I lose those people. Um, so that's one thing. But of course, um, with me working, uh, I'm contracting right now, and so between contracting and chasing clients and working on this, it's very difficult for me to organize that stuff and review patches and do the other stuff that I need to do. This is the link to the open CMI issue list. Right now, it's, right now it's a little difficult because we have a lot of big architecture issues, but as we resolve those, and a lot of those are getting reasonably near to being resolved, or at least to the point where they have patches that are, that are worthy of review, um, that, that'll be a great place to get involved. Um, and the highest priority ones are always marked critical and major, so you can focus there. Um, as I said before, I'm looking for funding to, to get myself to work on CMI full time through the end of the year. Because as you see here, we have a lot of stuff that we want to do, and I really want to do it. And I would really prefer to be doing that than, you know, than, than hacking form alters into Drupal 7 websites for clients, you know. Um, and I think there's a lot more value in me to do that, but I have to eat and feed my cat and things. And so, um, um, if, you're, if you work for a company that you think might be interested in funding the configuration management initiative or you own or represent a company that you think might be interested in funding the, uh, the initiative, then get in touch with me. I have detailed funding proposals written up and I would love to talk to you about getting involved. Um, and another thing that would be really helpful is resource donation, which is that um, a lot of people, because of their budgets or whatever, can't donate money, but they have people with spare time who would like to get involved. I would love to talk about that as well. Um, one of the things that's really, that's, that's really valuable to me there is if you can promise that your developer will have five hours a week to work every week, that's incredibly valuable to me, much more than I have a developer who can work 40 hours for the next two weeks and then they're gone. Because I don't have to ramp those people up, I have a reliable resource that I can work on and plan for. One of the things, that, again, about our community is that it's very hard to plan timelines and milestones when our resources are scattered all over the place and coming and going and things like that. So if you have anything like that, please talk to me. I would love to hear about it. Um, and um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and now if anybody has any questions for the next 20 minutes, I would love to uh, talk and answer them. Um, I have a quick question. Can you walk us through what a deploy looks like in a CMI world where, we, where this works in your ideal case with all the cool stuff is done? Um, yes, as soon as, as soon as my computer, I don't know why this is happening because I am actually plugged in over here. Um, I'm plugged into an outlet that's not plugged in. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter, I'm done. Um, what an, an ideal deploy to me would be, um, for instance, um, you have a bunch of developers who work on a site. Um, they, um, they work, they, they are um, periodically committing their configuration changes to Git. Um, you would mentally, you would probably enter into a similar workflow that you do in features. You create a view, you do a drush fu and you, com you, you do a diff to make sure that you've updated the things that you think you're going to update it and you commit it to Git and then people can merge those in and work on it on their sides. Um, the workflow would be very similar to that except you wouldn't actually have to put you um, to specifically run the update and, I, and in an ideal world it will cover everything and you don't have to write update hooks and things like that. You commit those to GIF. Um, when people pull configuration in, they will um, either through a drush command as part of your build process or um, through the UI say, oh look, I've got new configuration, punch a button or it'll happen in your build scripts and that con configuration would be loaded and then become live on your system. You work and work and work and work and then you could take the configuration that's in that, that's now in that, you know, Git repository 
push it to a staging site, run the same process, import it, everything's great. And you know, they say, oh, you know, I need some changes here. Um, and then they make them on the staging site. And you're like, oh, crap, they made it on the staging site. But thankfully, you have an import directory that's separate from your live directory. So the stuff that they make the staging site could actually be in a different Git repository. And this is where the diagram that I have is really useful. Um, that gets pushed back to the developers, and they can import that back into their site, and you get this kind of circular workflow going, which is really useful for pushing stuff back and forth, especially if you have clients who are enabled to do things like munch views on their own and things like that, which in an ideal world we would all love and we can't do now because it makes our lives hell. Then um, you take that stuff that's on your staging site and push it to the live site, and you've got the same process. You can do another circular workflow there or from the live site back to these guys and then you can prevent these guys from going to the live site. And then um, if you wanted to, you could easily implement, for instance, a switch on your live site that says, I'm turning the admin off. And then they can't make changes. Um, and that's very easy to do because we have a central API through which everything flows. Um, and, and so to me, that would be an ideal workflow. It's a workflow that's exactly like your code workflow but still enables the, the UI stuff that really makes Drupal the popular system that it is. That was really our goal from the beginning. For someone who's in a simple site, like they have a local host and a live site, they, you know, they can do the same thing. They can just FTP files around, right? It's the same process. It's just a slightly different workflow. And in, 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 in reality, it's actually a much more similar workflow to what those kinds of users are used to in Dreamweaver, right? They write a bunch of HTML code and they push a bunch of files up and it's ready to go, right? And so, and actually, it'll make a ton of sense for that kind of use case as well. Really? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I was wondering what you think uh, the future of uh, features will be. I've actually talked to those guys a lot. Um, and what the feature, future of features will really be is that it'll just become a UI for configuration management. It may, um, it may present some more advanced features. Like I don't have the ability to group um, pieces of configuration and only push those, right? So they may um, wrap around configuration so that you could still do, here is the view and the image style and the content type I need for a photo gallery and distribute it, right? Um, you know, I don't have anything like that. Um, they will probably, they may also implement some things that we're not implementing but will hopefully be possible to do things like um, here's a diff of the configuration on your disk versus what's in the live site or even better here's a diff of what's on your on your disk versus what's on your live site versus what was on your live site the last time you did an import um, and you know maybe even do a thing like I want to take this piece of configuration and make it live but not this one you know um, there's all sorts of really cool things that as we sit around and talk about could be enabled if we had time to do them. And you know, a lot of that advanced stuff I don't really think is necessarily appropriate for core anyways, but we're trying to make sure that the APIs make, sure, make all that stuff work. So that's the kind of thing I think features will be good for. In the end, what will happen is that features module will get like 80% smaller because all of the code that they're doing that's one-off implementations of stuff that's in core or supporting exportables or things like this can just go away. Anybody else? Great, thanks for coming. Oh, Whitehead, please. Uh, no, so it, it was more about, and it occurred to me quite recently about the fact, yeah, how all of this is going to translate um, about the update, hook update and uh, functions and how stuff that are uh, curr currently accessed in, d in, in, in DB tables, stored in DB tables, config that have uh, a predetermined um, schema mm -hmm. since they are in SQL uh, uh, tables. Um, so right now we have a kind of, maybe that relates to the metadata part of, of the presentation where we, are, we have those currently structured files without a schema and so that this thing about uh, we currently are not supposed to invoke uh, uh, API functions within, within uh, hookup that n 
I'm, yeah, I was not completely sure how, how this maps to the, the new system and how we are going to to manage the fact that yeah, like we are we are changing the the the, the, the storage um, format for a given config uh, thingy, or or to you know I, I need to change a, a setting in across all uh, text field types right. definitions that currently exist on the site but I'm not supposed to call a the the uh, for a regular API functions to do that so yeah I, I'm not sure it's not clear in the right line in my mind how this maps to the new uh, formulation of how config is stored mm -hmm. I mean um I mean, we're not going to have schemas, so a lot of things that get validated by the database right now won't be. And if they're important to you, you're going to have to do it yourself, right? Um, and um, as far as what best practices for implementing updates is going to be, I think that's something we're going to have to work through. And um, it relates back to the stuff that I was talking about versioning, right? If I, if you, um, if you update. Uh, your module in a way that changes the schema of your underlying files, you are absolutely going to have to go through and find all of those files and update them and reshape them by hand. That's right. Um, possibly, out, depending on how your API functions are designed, possibly outside of those. Um, and since you are the module owner and you know enough to do that, it, maybe it's okay, right? We do that with the database sometimes too, right? Um, I, you know, it's something we're just going to have to work out, I think. And as and if we involve and if we and if we encounter problems um, as we're working through, we'll have to make changes. We'll have to update the APIs. Yes, right now we have like one of uh, helper update function, like update field the data. Yeah, and yeah. The dedicated function that mm -hmm. takes care of updating the field definition within a hook update plan that mm -hmm. doesn't fire any hooks or anything. Right, like right, just right. Likes the table. Right, right. And Right. Functions to write to the config to the config store without firing hooks. Right. It should normally be so right. Fire. Right, or something like that. But I mean, uh, I mean, you know, there will be. I mean, you may maybe you want to fire hire them because there are things like, you know, for instance, when I delete an image style, you know, we've got that option to go back to all of the fields that implement the image style and change them to things, and so it's like. Either you can do it by hand, or you can call the API that does it automatically. But then, if that API does other things that you don't want to, I mean, you know, it's you we're going to have to work that stuff out. Anyway, it's not probably not very deep for this use case that what is going to use right now in the database. It'll be it's a little less structured, obviously, but yeah, that's probably true. about deploys um, how do you see downtime being impacted by this like for example right now when you deploy code there is a time between when the code is on the server and you run uh, updates and other things like that where the it's in an unstable state we have modules that are not loaded or vice versa um, do you see this as eliminating that or the same or how do you see that happening um, it's, it's going to be the same I mean you know um, you can't change changing a field changes the underlying structure of your database right and anything that changes the underlying structure of your database and then has to go through and modify the data that you, that is there is going to take time and in that time your your system is going to be unstable there's no way around that and we're not it's not like we're changing the field system to fix that problem so um, there, we've, there have been discussions about whether or not when we run this system we should force your site into maintenance mode, for instance. Um, most people don't like that idea. Um, and um, I think our best thing to do is to focus on making the actual updates run as quickly and performantly as possible. And anything that um, can't be to run it into the queue system as long as the data, as long as your thing can, site can run and it can run in the background for things like field updates like the delete stuff and stuff like that um, um, and focus on it that way but I mean to some extent I mean and you know for simple stuff it'll be just like running updates now um, you know uh, your site will be fine as the simple stuff goes as, um, or maybe be slightly weird until you clear cache or something like that right but uh, but overall I don't see the situation being much different than the way it is now as far as that goes Thanks a lot, everybody.